And friends, this morning, I invite us to stand as we join together for our call to worship. Turn us, O God, away from the world's temptation. Return us, O God, to the quiet calm of your presence. Restore us, O God. Orient us, O God. Please be seated. Our words, our deeds, our lives build barriers between us and others, between us and God. But God would shatter every distinction. God would reshape us as new people. Let us come to the one who loves us and longs to forgive us as we offer our confession, saying, God, our refuge, you hear our cries for mercy. You lift the lowly and offer hope to the hopeless. We Amen. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah saying, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. 
And as those called by God, let us fearlessly greet each other. May the peace of Christ be with you. And friends, let us join together in our prayer for illumination. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Open us to your life-giving word. Quiet the voices within us that do not align with your will. Focus our minds on the message you intend for us so we may faithfully discern your way. Amen. And I'd like to invite any children or children at heart to come on down. Huck and Arlo, it is so good to see you guys. It feels like it has been forever. How are you doing? Sunglasses? So let me ask you a question. Um, what is, are we on? Yeah, okay. Uh, what is the, uh, the best food to eat? The best food yeah. to eat is waffles. Waffles, ha <laughs> ha, I love that one. Waffles, yes. Waffles are delicious. Um, some people would say like, Broccoli is the best food to eat. Yeah. Yeah. And carrots. And carrots. Do you like broccoli and carrots? Yeah, and vegetables and you, fruit. Wow, that is great. See, vegetables and fruit, that's like healthy food. Um, what about like M&M's? You like M&M's? Yeah. Yeah. That's a treat. That's a treat. Wow, man. Last night, I went to somebody's birthday party. Henry yeah. Ice cream sundaes and cake, and um, I had a mini cake <laughs> and a cupcake. Also, ice cream sundaes, cake, and a cupcake. And donuts. And donuts. <laughs> That's killing me. Oh my gosh, that must have been so much fun, right? <laughs> but 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 you wouldn't you wouldn't want to have like that for all your food all the time. Yeah. Yeah, right? So it was fun, right? But yeah. sometimes you need to eat fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Sometimes you need to eat waffles, right? Yeah. So so there's all kinds of food that that we can eat. Some of it is really really good for us. Some of it is just really really fun for us to eat. Um, but here's the thing. No matter what we eat, whether it's the whether it's broccoli or whether it's ice cream and cake, um, it's just going to it's just going to um, be in us, right? So it's going to make us healthy, or maybe it might give us a tummy ache, right? But it just, it's, it's just in us, right? So the food that we put into our mouths, that's just about us. What are some things that could come out of your mouth that aren't very good? Like, are there words that could come out of your mouth that aren't good words? Like, 
like if you uh, if if you told your brother, man, that is the that is the ugliest shirt I have ever seen. That's a very good shirt, by the way. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it wouldn't be nice if you said that to your brother, right? Um, or if you yelled something uh, something mean back at your mom, right? That wouldn't be nice. So Jesus tells this story where he says, you know, the food that we eat, that just, that just goes inside us. That's all about us. And if it's going to hurt anybody, it's going to hurt us. But the things that come out of our mouth, the words that we use, those are the really important things um, because those can hurt other people. So Jesus reminds us that the words that come out of our mouth are more important than the food that we put into our mouth and that we should always try to say the best things. So you could say, Huck, that is the best shirt I have ever seen, right? Because that would make him feel good. Or you could say to your mom, Mom, you are the best mom ever and pretty on top of it, right? You could say. See, so, uh, so this week, I want you to think about all the good things that you can say to people. Try to say those things. Let's take a minute and talk to God in prayer. Oh God, we are grateful for, uh, for broccoli and carrots, for waffles, for, uh, for M&Ms, for ice cream, and for cake, and for cupcakes, and all the wonderful food that uh, can nourish our bodies and, uh, and make us feel happy. And we pray that the things that come out of our mouths, the words that we say, will be good and will help other people to feel happy. So help us to use, uh, to use only words that, that uh, build people up and help other people feel really good. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. And we end a prayer. What do we say? Amen. Amen. Exactly. Thank you so much. It's so good to or, see you guys. Yeah, or amen. Amen. Yes, you can say either way. Amen or amen. Amen. <laughs>
And yet, despite all the good work that Jesus is doing, the Pharisees are worried that he isn't washing his hands before he eats. Jesus' condemnation of the religious authorities is pretty damning. Maybe that's why Jesus and company then go to a foreign, non-Jewish territory to, to get out of sight for a while. There, a woman comes out of nowhere and demands Jesus' attention. She shouts and begs for healing for her daughter. The woman is unclean by Jewish law, and the disciples react negatively to her. Jesus also has a knee-jerk reaction and seems to write her off. It's questionable whether he sees her at all until she gets right up in front of him and refuses to be ignored. This is one of the more troubling texts in the Gospels because we see Jesus saying one thing, doing another. Let's listen for God's word to the church as we encounter the word made flesh in Matthew chapter 15. Jesus called the crowd near and said to them, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that contaminates a person in God's sight. It's what comes out of the mouth that contaminates the person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended by what you just said? Jesus replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father didn't plant will be pulled up. Leave the Pharisees alone. They are blind people who are guides to blind people. But if a blind person leads another blind person, they will both fall into a ditch. Then Peter spoke up, explain this riddle to us. Jesus said, don't you understand yet? Don't you know that everything that goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what goes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and that's what contaminates a person in God's sight. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual sins, thefts, false testimonies, and insults. These contaminate a person in God's sight. But eating without washing hands doesn't contaminate in God's sight. From there, Jesus went to the regions of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from those territories came out and shouted, Show mercy! On me, son of David, my daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. But Jesus didn't respond to her at all. His disciples came and urged him, send her away. She keeps shouting after us. Jesus replied, I've been sent only to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. But the woman knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, help me. Jesus replied, it is not good to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall off their master's table. Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith will be just as you wish. And right then, her daughter was healed. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Let's just cut right to it. Jesus calls this Canaanite woman a dog. And the insult was as belittling and cruel then as it would be today. Jesus' response was as unchristian as if a, a poor, distressed, and needy Muslim mother walked into here today asking for food for her children, and we said, sorry, but we only help people like us. Our resources are limited. We have to take care of our own first. 
And by this, his own admission, this woman is certainly not one of Jesus' own. She's a different ethnicity from a different cultural heritage, a different religion. And Matthew really wants us to get that. In Mark's nearly identical version, which Matthew almost certainly appropriated, she is called Syrophoenician, which is just another way of saying she was from Tyre and Sidon. But Matthew uses a more loaded name, Canaanite. And we might not get that distinction, but Matthew's audience sure would. In his time, Canaanite was an insulting derogatory term going all the way back to the repatriation of the exiles centuries before after their Babylonian captivity. And of course her gender furthered distances her from Jesus. So she may have been a lost sheep but she wasn't from Jesus's flock. I wasn't sent for her or her kind, he says. The exchange, besides being rather callous, is also kind of ironic. Jesus had just irritably lectured the, the disciples on how what we say is what defiles us, and then he goes off and says something kind of defiling to this woman. And the irony is compounded because it is what comes out of the woman's mouth, not Jesus's, that saves her daughter. It's fair to say that this is a story of tables turned. In the first scene, Jesus gets the punchline. He gets the better of the Pharisees and the scribes. In the second, it's the woman who delivers the gotcha. And that's why I love this story. I really love this story. I love it because it brings Jesus close to us. Jesus becomes almost uncomfortably human. It shows his humanity extending beyond his ability to feel sorrow as we do, or to feel pain or loneliness or anger or thirst as we do. It shows his humanity extending even to our prejudices. This story exposes some of the limits that being human places on us simply by virtue of being born in a particular place at a particular time and to particular parents. Limits that Jesus perhaps needed to feel in order to fully experience what it means to be us. And to be sure, none of us sees the world and its people with a completely unbiased perspective. We're all creatures of our culture. For instance, most of us here today would consider ourselves proud to be American. We love our country and probably wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But do you think Canadians or Brazilians love their countries any less? Mary Louise and I were in Paris uh, one year on Bastille Day, French Independence Day. It was the best fireworks ever. The French really love France. So you can't criticize a, a Hindu born in Mumbai or for not loving Jesus, apple pie, and the red, white, and blue. All humans, even Jesus, it appears, bump up against our limits. My late mother-in-law, Louise, she was born and raised in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in a time of segregation, Jim Crow. Louise had this beautiful picture of herself when she was just a little girl, maybe four or five years old. Lovely. She looks like her daughter. Her daughter looks like her. Mary Louise and I have that, that photo now. And the first time Louise showed it to me, she reminisced very winsomely about her childhood. She talked about her father, J. Walter Bishop. J. Walter was, for his time and place, uh, very progressive man who 
did not share the animosities, indeed the hatreds of many of his white peers. He raised his children to see African Americans as worthy of respect and dignity. And he treated those who worked in his household, there were just a couple, he treated those who worked in his household well, and he paid them a fair and living wage. But as my mother-in-law described her father's attitude toward this, this small household staff, it was, it was clear that the relationship was more benevolent paternalism than an employer-employee relationship among true equals. J. Walter Bishop was, uh, by all accounts, a good man who sought to do right by every person that he encountered. And even when he fell into debt and, uh, and owed a lot of money, he refused to declare bankrupt, bankruptcy and he paid back every person that he was indebted to. Mr. Bishop was a remarkable man who was able to see out a lot farther than many of his peers. But he couldn't see all the way. And it would be unfair to judge him harshly for missing some things that may seem obvious to us. In today's story, we see that even Jesus had a limit to his vision of his mission. He believed that he was sent only to his own, the sheep of Israel. And when this outsider demands to be let in, he says no. But God bless her. This woman, she doesn't accept Jesus' silent treatment. She does not believe that the son of David should ignore her or her pleas for mercy. She will kneel before Jesus in humility, but she will not roll over in humiliation. And in her brazen refusal to accept that she and her afflicted daughter are somehow unacceptable, we discover that Jesus, the teacher, is also teachable. By taking the initiative in this exchange, this woman teaches Jesus that faith is not only believing that God will act in response to our pleas, it's also believing that even those who are not part of the officially sanctioned insider group are entitled to and should receive mercy from the God whose kingdom has broken forth into the entire world through Jesus. And Jesus incorporates this lesson into his life and mission. Gail Ricciuti is a pastor and scholar who used to teach at Colgate Rochester Crozer Divinity School up in Rochester. She writes about how in Matthew we meet Jesus BCW, before Canaanite woman. And when we meet her BCW, Jesus shows, when we meet him, BCW, Jesus shows partiality to his own people. And he distinguished between insiders and outsiders. He can even be rigid, demanding, perfectionistic. But ACW, after Canaanite woman, his encounters have a shifted nuance. His stories, a, a new and pronounced bias for the poor and the outsider. There's a kind of softening of his character. There is an insight threading its way through the rest of Matthew that traces back to the argument with this Canaanite dog. And I love this notion of a changeable, teachable Jesus. Something moves in him, in his encounter with this woman, that causes his actions to line up with his words from the previous scene. 
It gives me hope that we too might learn a new thing every now and again, that we too might see things differently, have our eyes opened. It teaches me that to be Christ-like includes being vulnerable and mutable, changeable. Being attentive to the voices of those on the outside, those on, those on the margins who are there, not because God put them there, but because we did. The Canaanite woman was convinced that she was worthy of calling Jesus Lord, even if Jesus himself didn't think she was. After their encounter, Jesus didn't leave a, a different person, but an enlarged person, an ever more and even more enlightened person. Jesus left not with a different sense of mission and purpose, but with a fuller sense of mission and purpose. I wonder if any of you can look back on your lives and see your own BCW, ACW times. Times when you saw things one way and now see things more, further. So there are at least a, a couple of things that we can think about and work with this week as we continue to explore and experience this passage. I think there's a, a lot for us to, uh, to chew on, both in the passage and some of the ideas I've presented. First, can we accept that Jesus could ever be mean or have a change of heart? Can we accept that Jesus is both more like us than we comfortably imagine and that Jesus is less willing than we would prefer to conform to our preconceived notions of who he is or supposed to be? And second, can we accept that we as the church, certainly as the larger church, Christianity in general, but maybe sometimes even this church, can we imagine that the church could be cruel or unkind or exclusionary or dismissive and that there are voices out there outside the church that can hold us accountable? That is, is it possible that even as the church is called to critique our culture, that there are voices in the culture that can legitimately critique the church. Perhaps this week, you might think about all the people that you know, and even about all the people that you know about. According to uh, Google, there are now about seven and a half billion of us. And then maybe think smaller. Maybe think about this table right here, a table from which our most precious bread is served. And then ask yourself, is there any one of them, any one of those seven and a half billion people, any person of any economic status or, or nationality or religion or gender or sexuality, uh, anyone to whom ACW Jesus would say, there's no place for you here. My body and blood are not for you. Can you imagine anyone like that? And what does it mean for our life, for our church, for our world, if the answer is ever yes? Amen.
Friends, please be seated. And we come now to that time in our worship when we join our hearts and our minds together in prayer. And I'd invite you to share any prayers or petitions, joys or concerns that we might entrust to each other and lift up to God. Um. Yesterday, my hubby was talking to Debbie Elkhorn, who used to come to church because we used to pick her up every Sunday. Um, she had some kidney stones that had to be taken care of, and she's back home, and she's, you know, a little under the weather, but she's doing better. And yesterday, my granddaughter, Brittany, called her mom twice, called me twice, and then they put Jackson on the phone, and we all went to Conneaut. Ohio and had supper with them because little Jackson needed some hugs and kisses from grandma and great grandma So that's why I was not here last night. Otherwise, I would have been here. So I hope you forgive me this time My niece, Wanda Salas, died yesterday after such a long battle with brain cancer. Needless to say, the family is so devastated, and there's no way I can go because it's in Texas. They weren't even able to talk to me today. It's been such a long time of this with surgery and everything. So we need to pray for the whole family if they can get through this. On a lighter note, my husband did come home Sunday afternoon and he's doing well, getting uh, treatments, you know, the care that you get afterwards. But he'd be happy to see anybody if they'd like to take a trip to <laughs> Gerard to see him. He would love that. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, some of you may know uh, that uh, Dave Hume is in hospital. Uh, he's at uh, Mill Creek Community Hospital. Uh, visited him yesterday morning, and he has pneumonia. Um, they're treating it, and he hopes to be discharged in the next couple days to, to go back home. Um, I have a, a, a great joy. Um, yesterday, and usually I don't do this, but I, I have to give some recognition. Uh, it was a fabulous day. I, I received so many compliments of people that came from all over and said that what we had out here in our courtyard was fabulous. Um, but it wouldn't have been fabulous because they were thanking me. But I had um, Dave Miner, Tom and Andrea, Jan Ryan, and Bill Macrino. It wouldn't have been as successful without them because they worked all day, Friday and yeah. Saturday, gave up their time and then recharge and their people helped and we put on a fabulous meal uh the music was great and i'm just proud that emmanuel can say that we had that so it, it's just a great joy it was I a think. great day thank yes. you keith yeah but what about that what about the one drummer in that one uh in angelo's band what about that drummer okay you didn't talk you didn't talk about him you got to say something there right <laughs> Um, yeah, if you didn't get to be there and see it, um, he does a fantastic job, and Pastor Mike, yes, <laughs> and hooking him up with Angelo, uh, I know a lot of people, a lot of musicians, a lot of bands, and I, I even prayed about it, and I just felt that Angelo uh, and Shaney and Paul were perfect for the fit with Pastor Mike. And he's actually performed with them four or five times, times now, yeah. I think. Uh, so it was a good fit, and uh, he did an awesome job. Yeah, I'm so grateful for that introduction. They've, uh, uh, they've become not just uh, people I like to play with, but uh, uh, blooming friendship. Yes, yes, definitely. 
And Keith, I know you don't like to take the credit, but man, this thing doesn't go down without you, pal. Let me tell you right there. That's for sure. Give him a hand. Oh, and Amy, you know what? After packing all his drums up and everything, now we know why people play the flute. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Friends, let's pray. Eternal God, please hear us as we raise our prayers, our petitions, our joys, and our concerns. God, our rock, we are questioning what we once assumed to be sturdy and stable. Our economy feels fragile, our democracy vulnerable, our country angrily divided. It's hard to keep up with the pace of change and our options can feel limited. We don't know what to do to make things better. Life can be overwhelming and we, your people, need your help. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. O Creator God, the natural world groans for relief as temperatures rise, as wildfires rage, as storms batter our coasts, as natural disasters regularly and tragically endanger lives. And we pray for those without the resources to rebuild after disaster strikes. We pray for the sick whose lungs are vulnerable to polluted air. We pray for the evacuated, the refugee, the desperate, and the destitute. We pray for your earth to be renewed and for greater willingness on our part to participate in that renewal and turn away from policies and practices that endanger our planet. O oh, Prince of Peace, Save us from ourselves. Save us from our violence and warring madness. Defeat dictators bent on hoarding power and military leaders grabbing for it. Protect the innocent from injustice. Strengthen the honorable. Bless us all with the moral courage to follow Christ's way of love. We pray especially for those persecuted because of their race or their religion or their economic status or their gender or their expression. Help us to see the full humanity and reality of every person, even and especially those not like us. Oh Lord, hear the cries of your people. Hear our prayer. God, we come to you with prayers of petition today. We pray for those who mourn, for Blanche's, for the family of Blanche's niece. We pray for those in hospital or recovering for Dave, for Betty. We give you thanks for the healing that you have provided for Jack and continue and pray that you would continue to, uh, to revive him. And we give you thanks today Thanks for the blessings of family that can come around us in times of trial, in times of sorrow, and even for the joys of grandchildren who just want to see their grandparents. Merciful God, we are not without help or hope. Acts of compassion inspire in the face of all that is hard and harsh. Communities are collaborating to meet needs in new and exciting ways. People long silenced are finding and using their voice. 
Grant us ever greater awareness of what we can accomplish when we work together for the flourishing of your kingdom. Holy God, the greatest threats are those that lead us to lock ourselves down, to close our minds and hearts, to build barriers, to divide and protect. May your spirit encourage our faith as we stand open-hearted, praying and believing in your endless mercy. And Lord, in your mercy, hear us now. Hear us as the body of Christ and your covenant community as we boldly pray the prayer Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And friends, the, the work of this church, our ministry and our mission, our ability to provide for worship and for, uh, for gathering, for celebration. All of that depends upon your generosity, and we are so grateful for the ways that, uh, that you faithfully support the work and ministry of this congregation. So let us with joy present our tithes and our offerings.
Christ hath ever stood, thou savest So there is a, a movement through Matthew's gospel that Matthew brings to a wonderful, clear conclusion. When at the end of his gospel, he describes Jesus standing, the risen Christ, standing with his disciples. And he says, Jesus came near and spoke to them. I have received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go and make disciples of all nations. And friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord's face radiate with joy because of you. And may the Lord look deep into your eyes and grant you peace. And may that peace which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds at rest in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>